welcome to the Mind Money Spectrum podcast, where your hosts, Aaron Ogti and Trisha Patel, go beyond traditional finance questions to help you explore how to use your money to achieve the freedom you want in life. In this episode, Trishel asks Aaron about his childhood experiences and earliest memories related to money. What motivates you? What leads to the decisions you make? Where do your values come from? Often, it is your experiences throughout your childhood and developmental years that matter the most. Trishel digs deep to help Aaron explore how his personal history has impacted his character and values. And listen to the end to see what lessons around money Aaron tries to teach his children. And now, on to our conversation. Hi, my name is Aaron Ogti. I'm a financial advisor in the Bay Area, and I'm here with Trishel Patel, a wealth manager on the East Coast. Hi, Aaron. Great to be here today. And thanks, everybody, for listening to our podcast. Great to be here as well. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So last week, we talked about Kinder's three questions and how they apply to life planning and how they're designed to help individuals and couples and their advisors really identify the values they have in life that then allow you to make better decisions related to money and career that are truly in line with your life. And these three questions are really, really effective and fairly powerful and oftentimes make people cry as they, they get that introspective. Today, we're continuing the theme of kind of emotional questions related to about money and how you feel about money. And instead of me asking Trishel these three questions, Trishel's going to ask me a series of questions related to childhood and developmental stages and the, what, how I feel about money and growing up. And I'm going to try and share some personal stories. And hopefully, as you hear these questions, you can start to think about how you feel about money and how much your childhood upbringing impacts that. And then for those in relationships or those that are married, you can also use these questions with your spouse to understand why they feel certain ways about money. We know that money and work can be one of the biggest drivers of divorce. So if you can understand why your spouse feels a certain way about money, you can start to bridge that gap and strengthen your relationship. So today it's going to be me getting personal, but a lot about, about my upbringing and Trishel asking me the questions. Does that sound like a good idea, Trishel? That does sound good. I think it, it fits quite well into what we think about in terms of a process of coming up with a plan for an individual Hmm. because at a high level, we want to understand what really motivates somebody and why does an individual make the choices they do. And often it ties to their values. And when you think about their values, often there is this component that ties back to money. So I, I think these will all kind of make sense as we go through it, but that might give our listeners just an understanding at a high level of how this all fits into the bigger picture. I like that. I like that idea of relating it back to planning and why this is important in conversations between advisors and their clients. Right. The notion is quite simple. We really want to understand our clients as a person to better plan for their future. And that's basically what life planning is all about. It's not really only about the finances, but what somebody wants to do with their life. And when it comes to the discussions that we've been having, for example, last week, what we pulled out is the notion that there are values that people hold dear, and it's important for us to understand what they are. Often these values relate to a few common themes that we even discussed at a high level last week, the notion of family and relationships, that's quite important to people, but also the notion that people value giving back or they value being creative or having a creative outlet for what they're trying to express as a human. They also value the notion of having spirituality be a part of their lives. 
And the, the last thing that often comes up with individuals is this notion of a sense of place on the planet or the notion that you want to care for the world that we have and the environment. But if you think about all these values that may be uncovered through our discussions, they often have this money component. So it's important to understand an individual's relationship with money. And that, that's what the series of questions that we'll be digging into today will kind of go through. Sounds good. I'm ready. All right. So, so you know, just kick things off. How was money when you were growing up? Can you give us some insight into that, Aaron? So my mom was an elementary school teacher and my dad was in the Navy. So we were, we always felt, and I, I'm cautious to use this term uh, in today's culture, but I always felt we were a very normal middle-class income family. We, my both parents worked as I grew up and that was probably one of the driving things, especially as related to, to household income. And as an adult, I've learned that middle class has such a huge range and something like 90% of the population considers themselves middle class. So that might not be the best descriptor, but I use that in the sense that I never felt like we were rich. We never had extra money, but I was also not worried about going hungry. So we, we, I knew that bills were a thing and we had to be conscious of them but the power never got turned out and never got turned off and I always had enough food for school. Sometimes got sports equipment, although it was never used, never exactly right. It was always kind of trying to fit whatever we could find used into the situation. But that was a general thing. Like we were comfortable. We, we were doing just fine, but never anything extra. And so I, I have two other siblings, so I have a younger brother, younger sister, so there were three of us. Knew from a fairly early age that my parents weren't going to pay for college at all. I knew I knew never to ask for anything. So kind of that was one of the things things that I've been thinking about in preparation for this. My brother and my sister and I, we knew we got presents on our birthdays and at Christmas. And that was very consistent. And my parents were able to afford presents and toys on birthday and Christmas, but we never got anything outside of that. And so we never asked for anything outside of that. We went into a grocery store or a commissary. Commissary is the military grocery store, basically. And the Navy Exchange is the military department store. But we go into those versions, so kind of like going to Target, and we just never asked for anything because we knew the answer was going to be no. And that was a fairly consistent theme throughout our childhood that we had everything we needed, but we never got anything we wanted. If I guess I have to say, try and sum it up that way. Well, it, it's interesting. Not only did you not get everything you wanted, you didn't even ask for what you wanted either. Like what it, has that ever come up or what if you hypothetically were to ask for something? I would have to, if I was a kid and I, and I wanted to ask something, I would have to figure out how to phrase it as a need. Mm -hmm. as something like, so like it could never be a toy. I could never ask for a toy. But if I needed a new baseball glove or new cleats, I have to explain, here's why I need this new sports equipment. Or here's why I need this new thing for school. Or this if I could phrase it as a need, then it was possible. It definitely wasn't happening in the moment. Like, like it, there was that, I think that's one of the other things is, is that I don't feel any uh, sense of urgency when buying something. I tend to be very patient from that regard. I never really buy anything that's impulse related. I, I can resist that fairly easily. I can walk past the dollar section of Target and not buy anything. I'm not even phased by it. But I, if, I, if it's a need, I have no problem getting it. If it's a want, I'm going to research it. And was there ever a situation where you did try to express your, your need? Of course, it was a want, and it was kind of shut down. 
I don't think so. I I remember con- there were many times where I was mildly annoyed that the thing I had was used or secondhand and it just didn't quite fit correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd be thinking of like a baseball glove. Like you know, I, I'm adapting to this slightly inferior thing I have that has this one small defect because it's just so old. And I, and I adapt to that. And so but, how did that make you feel though? Um, in the moment, it felt normal, I guess I'd say. It felt like I just didn't have any other choice. I didn't have any other option. I, I didn't know, understand a world where you could go out and buy the new thing that's correct. Um, and so it seems like you accepted it pretty easily. Yeah. And I, I, th- I think part of it is because it was always the case. Hmm. It, it was fr- from, I, I guess I would have been a toddler. I might have asked for something as a toddler and been told no. And so I'd been told no so many times throughout my childhood that by the time I can remember, I just, it was not even the case that I even asked. So your your parents basically instilled that consistency of you can't get anything that you ask for. And they just maintained that throughout your entire childhood. Correct. And I th- that theme of expectation from a parent to a child is something that my wife and I have instilled with college where from before they were realized that we've done we've kind of kind of done it consciously it's not ever a question of if they go to college it's just a question of when they go to college and they go to college after high school that's just the expectation that they're aware of from before they could read and write and they were and they weren't, they're not conscious of that expectation. Took to kind of going into adulthood to think about that, expecting from the very beginning. I think actually even raising a dog uh, was what really kind of led us that you can train a dog however you want, as long as you're consistent from the very beginning. And if you ever deviate that from that, then you can be screwed. But mm. they learn that consistent expectation very, very well. And in a strange way, we saw it with our kids as well. As long as you, from the beginning, establish that consistent expectation and you don't deviate from that, then there's never a question about it. Like, you, you don't, they don't even know that there's another op- op- option out there. They don't know that there's another world out there. And how do you think that's helped frame your understanding of money today? Um, again, it, it's... I don't buy things on impulse. Mm-hmm. I tend to do a lot of research. Um, I I think about when I spend money, I'm spending it very intentionally. I have gotten over the stage of not spending money, period. And I I think about one one story. When when I I was in college, my freshman year, I was playing pool in the dorms a decent amount. And my birthday's in August. So for my birthday before my sophomore year, they got me a pool cue. So I'd have my own pool cue to play with because they're a little heavier. You can unscrew them. And they tend to be just a little bit nicer than what you see in the dorms. And they're always going to be straight. And the very first time I used it, on the first break, the tip broke off. Oh, no. And in the moment, I remember I was – a lot of feelings related to money in childhood. This, this is one of those, like, weird memories that's really stuck with me. But in terms of, of feelings, I felt that my parents were cheap. That I wanted something that's nicer than what I had in the dorms, and they got me something worse. I also felt guilty that this was my birthday present that they got for me, and I, I didn't like it, and I broke. Um, 
and it was this because I was in college I was a little older a little more mature than I was as a child it was kind of a conscious realization that my parents try to avoid spending money so much that they almost always got the cheapest thing rather than the the nexus of quality and cost Mm -hmm. and so now as an adult because I don't I don't have that feeling of impulse I am consistently looking for that relationship between quality and cost and I actually don't mind spending money to get the best thing if I'm confident that it will last a long time and I'll get a lot of use out of it and it will be the highest quality but if I'm not confident that it's going to be the best and the high quality, then I'm probably going to default to the cheapest option. And that's one of those feelings that has stuck with me as an adult, that I do a lot of research whenever I'm making a, a big purchase. I'm looking at getting a car, getting a computer, getting anything, in new electronics, uh, basically almost anything over 50 to $100. I read Amazon reviews and I'm looking at air compressors to pump up kids bike tires and like okay I want to make sure I get the best one of these and uh, I continue to look at that that quality versus cost conversation right so like it's not necessarily the cheapest or the most expensive where you'll find the most value it's probably somewhere in the middle um not necessarily there's there are sometimes it's in the middle, but it almost my if I, I actually feel like it might be the other way. It's it's almost tends to be either the most expensive or the least expensive. Hmm. Uh, where the the most expensive a lot of times is the highest quality. Now this you get it's like going into like the marketing and brand recognition and which brands have a reputation for quality, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you have an, an example of that? Uh, when I think of like, like uh, snow equipment um, mm-hmm. and snow clothes, Columbia, North Face do a great job. It's going to be a, an amazing combination of weight and warmth. And I got a really nice ski jacket four or five years ago has a removable inside liner it has vents in the armpits for when it's warm and i can kind of open that up it, it keeps it does an amazing job of keeping warm and has the top the stretchy cords the bungee cords along the waistline to close it if it's windy has the powder skirt and i've used this many many times and i absolutely love it and this was a really really expensive jacket and i probably only would have gone with Columbia or North Face. In fact, mine is Columbia. But for my kids, because they're growing and the, what fits them is, there's a decent chance it doesn't fit them the following year. And so they might only get five wears out of it, maybe three on the low end and seven on the high end, but it's like they're going to wear it seven times in their life. I'm probably going for the absolute cheapest thing I can find. Uh, and these, these are not necessarily cheap compared to other clothing because it still has to be warm enough to keep them warm in the snow. But for my kids, I'm going to go really, really low cost on snow clothes. And a lot of times I'm asking friends around, like, hey, does anyone have any hand-me-downs? I know some snow clothes that have, we've received have gone through my family and then we've passed it on to other families. Now that I have three kids, I'm a little more comfortable with buying something for the oldest that all three kids are going to wear as they grow through it. But with snow clothes, the brand recognition of Columbia North Face are pretty strong. I don't think for myself that I would buy something not of those two brands unless I was walking into a store like REI or Any Mountain where I actually trust the brand of the store to have done that research for me. Now I haven't bought any new snow clothes in a long time, but I've seen like Spider and 
Arthrix, I think, if I get that correctly. Those also tend to look pretty good. That ends up being, that's one area, one example of where I am willing to pay for the quality for myself, knowing kind of how fickle I can be in terms of body temperature and also the range of temperatures that I could potentially go through. You could, I could be skiing and it's 50 degrees. I could be skiing and it's negative 10. And kind of have one consistent clothing option that I can add layers underneath or, or reduce layers to, make, to fit the day really appeals to me. I get the feeling your upbringing led to you having a quite rational approach when it comes to money. But I'm, I'm curious to know, are your siblings the same? Do, do you think they approach money the same uh, way as you do now? That's interesting. I would say we're pretty consistently future focused. Hmm. All three of us tend to do a pretty, pretty good job saving for the future. My brother also joined the Navy. He's now a helicopter pilot in the Navy. And one of the downsides of being in the Navy is you get relocated a lot. You have to, you're forced to move to different cities, states, and sometimes even countries. As uh, he, he went through training and flight school in Pensacola. He bought a house down there. Uh, the Navy also helps with VA loans, which requires zero down payment. Uh, there's a variety of other factors that go into that. And that's a, I don't even know if I'm qualified to have that conversation, but I do know that, that they make it a lot easier. His wife had already owned a home in Pensacola, and then they got relocated. I know they spent three years in Guam, couple years in Maryland. Now they're in Virginia. He's based out of Norfolk, the biggest naval base on the East Coast. And they have bought a few properties over the time where they move to a new city and buy a property. And then at, and when they move out, they rent it out. And that's one of those really consistent future thoughts that they have in mind, that they have gone for kind of higher cost of living in the moment, knowing that they'll likely be able to rent it out when they move out. My sister does an even better job on the saving side in terms of keeping her expenses low. She and her husband, they have two kids and they do a really, really impressive job of aggressively keeping their expenses low. They aren't quite exactly pursuing fire. They still want to work, but that is a big priority for them. And I do think that that is one of the consistent themes that came up because of our childhood. Indeed, it seems like the the values that your parents instilled, although you know you may have had some periods of time where it didn't feel ideal, it seems <laughs> like in the long run it, it provided you and, and your siblings with a pretty solid foundation when it comes to money and thinking forward. Yeah, for, uh, that's a really good way to phrase it, that we do consistently keep our expenses low and, and we're cost conscious and very forward thinking. There were other things that came up that were not the best lessons that I think I've overcome just from professional training. But that just okay. general theme of keep keeping expenses low and saving for the future was instilled pretty well. So in terms of not the best lessons, was that the notion of maybe it's not always best to get the cheapest? Is that what you're talking about? No, actually, my parents made a few questionable investments. They, I know at one point, invest, they bought a couple pay phones and that that ended up losing money that Wait, was, the, the things you put quarters in on the street corner yes yes i, I didn't know you could buy those yeah it's, it's like like you, it's similar to owning a laundromat kind of thing hmm. where so much of the money you make is from the quarters in the machines but it's a it was a it was a low significantly lower cost it was lower barrier to entry and so they wanted to try that and the only you just have to, you have to have like a monthly cost for the telephone company 
and you have to go around and collect the quarters. But that ended up losing money and being very poor. Um, I know when I first went through training as a financial advisor and getting my CFP, look at the 401k, they had more gold than I thought was appropriate. So, so just their general investment education was fairly weak. And that's one of the things that I've overcome as a professional and, and also had conversations with my siblings about. But it, so as I say, there, there were un, enough things that were also not the greatest lessons, but overall, I'm, I feel feel like my character was built. It's like I have all the all these kind of negative emotions as a child, but still have all the positive lessons. Right. It, it it's even the notion that when you're young, if you can provide an understanding of delaying gratification, something we, we discussed, I think, early on in, in one of our podcasts, that can have profound effects with an individual in life. You know, it's been shown that that can be one of the key differences in terms of providing an individual with the ability to overcome and, and persevere. Yeah. And that was, again, I think it's from before I can even remember was established as an expectation that that's so deeply ingrained that it never felt like a lesson. It never felt Mm. like I had to, to try to be taught. My parents never tried to teach that to me. It was just, part of our lifestyle right so then what do you think your greatest joy was as it relates to money that's a good question i think when i was in college i needed a new laptop I had enough scholarships and I had an idea of how much, how much I could spend, but it was the feeling of, of doing the research and figuring out the specific laptop that I wanted to buy, that I chose. I, th- I think that, that, now that I think about it, that was the key. This was the first kind of big thing that I chose. And I made sure I got the features that I wanted, I wanted to, it was going to last me a long time. I, I did my research. I, I had no problems kind of delaying the gratification aspect. Like it took me a while to, to figure this out, but it was the first thing that I truly felt that I chose and that that agency still sticks with me. Every other moment along the way was getting parent approval no, that costs too much. We're going with the cheaper option. Like, like every other month, like, oh, here's the thing we bought for you. Like, here's your shoes. Like, I, I, don't, I might have gotten a choice between two or three pairs of shoes if we went into the store. But a lot of times as a kid, it was just, here are your shoes. I ordered them. You have no choice in the say. No, no say in the choice. A lot of the clothing choices were like that as well. That I, I bought you clothes that fit. Here you go that sense of agency, that sense of I got to choose how my money was spent on the thing. I, I both needed, but the difference between the need and the want here is the, the need was the cheapest computer. The want was the best computer. What I feel is the, the good part is you hit that at an age where you could handle that responsibility, meaning not only did you have the agency, but you had the ability to employ that agency with money that was your own, in fact. That's interesting. I, I had not thought about that. That's a really good point. If, if I would even been just a few years younger, I don't know that I would have made a kind of responsible decision calculation. Right. It, it's hard to make that type of decision without, you know, having a lot of other things in place, but it it seems like that was the right time for you. Yeah, I I think you're right. Even 
in high school, I, I was delivering pizzas as a job. My parents had, not when I was 16, but a, around then, they bought an extra car. So we went from two cars to three cars. But it was very clear that this was their car that they were letting me use. And especially if I was going off to college, my younger siblings would use that car. I was allowed to use it for my job, so I was delivering pizzas. But the money I earned delivering pizzas was spent more on kind of almost feels like childhood once, like going to the movies, going to Taco Bell, candy, toys, like, like all those kind of little things. And mm -hmm. so I would have been 16, 17, 18 at this point, And it was still, I don't, I was not mature with my money at that point, in part because my parents took care of all my needs. So I didn't feel like I need, I, I didn't feel any connection between the money I earned delivering pizzas and buying new clothes because I, I had clothes. And I didn't feel any connection between that money saved up for like a, a school trip or function. Like they would still pay for anything related to school. So I, I kind of only had the once left, if that makes sense. Yeah. That, that's interesting as well, because, you know, that's an age where you can enjoy disposable income because Something that may be common with many people is when you first get a job, there's so many other buckets to fill, all of those needs to fill that mm -hmm. that disposable income kind of gets squeezed, especially if you're trying to you know save for retirement and a lot of other long term goals like a down payment on a house and a car and things like that. So even at that age, you know, being a, a teenager leading into adulthood. It seems like you, you had the opportunity to enjoy money from that perspective of just being able to dispose of it in a way that kind of like a an older teenager should. Yeah, I agree with that. And and I think it's also a factor I was I was still under eighteen and I also wasn't a ton of extra money because I was only working on a few weekends or I'd be working during the summer. So I, I might be working full time during the summer. So like, well, one of the summers I was, or two of the summers I was doing summer school because I was always doing extra classes for math. So I've been kind of summer between junior and senior year and summer after I graduated high school and before I started college. Those two summers I was probably working full time. But I'm, only, I'm making on the scale of a few thousand dollars over a few months. So it's, it just kind of also maybe wasn't so much money that I could have gotten in trouble. Right. So, so the, Did you end up saving any of that or were you basically just spending it? I saved very little, probably none. Yeah. I don't think I saved any, but I, I took kind of the responsibility. So a uh, fall of my freshman year, my first year on campus, I got a job as an intramural football referee and cause partly because I, I love football. I love playing in high school and I, I got a job to provide that additional extra spending mo money on some of the things that were fun. So the lesson and habit of, of working stuck with me through college. So I, I, and I worked for I am sports my entire time there, but the use of the money did not feel mature or adult hmm. so was that pizza job your your first job or did you have one before that no that was my first job so i would have been 16 and then did you have an allowance as you were growing up i did but not when i got to that age i, I forget i didn't have it when i was really young so i didn't quite understand it but i did have an allowance it might have been twenty dollars a month, probably like middle school ish. So I'm, mm. I'm gonna guess like seventh through tenth grade, or maybe a little bit before, because I don't know if I could use this money to buy 
magic cards if I wanted. Like, I still couldn't go anywhere. But I don't know if my parents use it as kind of incentives to do chores at mm-hmm. that age. Because the, the allowance was never tied to specific activities. We were just doing chores was part of our contribution to the household. So mm-hmm. I mowed the lawn. That was my job. I was the only, there was no other expectation. I didn't think, oh, someone else is going to mow the lawn. Right. So um, the allowance is just kind of not necessarily a, a paycheck, but more like a bonus or you, you just kind of get it, but you have to do the other stuff. Correct. Yeah. The, the other stuff was expected. I'd, I'd have to do it even if I didn't get allowance. But I, I think they started to understand that there might have been some other wants that were age appropriate that they wanted. The other thing about it, they didn't want me to ask them for money and say, hey, I, I like this, but it costs money. I don't have any. And they didn't want to like me go ask them for money to go see a movie. And I th- it's also possible that just I was older and my parents probably made a little bit more and, and some of the kind of childhood related expenses went down a little bit and th- they probably had a little bit more disposable income at that time. And so they used the allowance as a, kind of budgeting or restraint function of, you know what, we don't mind if he buys some of these things for fun, but we're going to limit it to $20 a month. So, so I, I think that was the number. And so it forced me to consciously think about, okay, this is all I have for this month, or if I want to buy something that costs more than $20, I have to save up for it for a few months. But it did allow me to kind of, yeah, have a little bit of that extra money but I never asked them for money. I don't think I ever asked them like, hey, my friends want to go see the movies. Can I have $10 or $5? So does that mean if you wanted to see a movie, you might think in your mind, okay, I'm going to get 20 bucks soon and then I'll go see it? I think at that point, between like gifts from grandparents, like they would write a check for 20 to $50 for my birthday they, I, I had, I probably had between five hundred and a thousand dollars, like in a checking account or a child savings account, mm-hmm. and I could ask my parents if I could take money out of that, of my own money, to go see the movie if I didn't have the twenty dollars from the allowance. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a, this kind of like, uh, I had it definitely was not a lot. I couldn't use this money per se. But if I didn't have the cash in my wallet or in my, I forget what little bank I had. So I, I, I always did have like $20 ish. And mm-hmm. if I didn't, they would take it out of my checking account or my savings account and use it for that. But maybe the, it's possible the balance was only like $200. Like it, it, it was low enough that I never felt like, oh, I have plenty of money. But it, I didn't feel like any strain from month to month. Like, oh, can't right. go see the movie with my friends this month. I have to wait till next month. I never, I never felt that strain. Did your parents ever put any constraints? Like, if you wanted to spend all the money on bubble gum or something, was that an issue? Um, I don't think so. But I don't think I asked. It, in part because I couldn't go to the credit union to make the withdrawal, anyways. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to ask them for something frivolous like that. Like it it just, that additional barrier made it more important. And I I didn't want to seem as childish kind of thing. Hmm. It's, I, I feel like a lot of these things have led to a sense of responsibility that, that have been not only helpful as an adult, but they were helpful in terms of being age appropriate. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know that my parents were as introspective and conscious as it relates to parenting values. I think that they were very conscious of their own life values and what, the, and what they wanted to 
see us grow into as adults. I think that that's why they were very conscious of just good life values that adults should have. They were not conscious of, okay, here's the age where we're going to I'll introduce this aspect and allow them to do this. Mm -hmm. it, it was more like, okay, now feels the right time. We, we feel that he's mature enough, responsible enough. And over time, they kind of gave just a little bit more freedoms. And that, that makes sense. As I took on more responsibilities, I got a little bit more freedoms and they, they adapted along the way. I think it, uh, they're also pretty responsible and nerdy as a kid that they they never felt like I was going to go out and buy drugs. They, they, they never felt I was going to use the money massively inappropriately. Mm -hmm. And then how do you think that shaped your relationship with money as it relates to your kids? <sighs> That's another good question. I do talk to them about the, there's still, so again, they're, they're eight, six, and three. So they're not quite old. The eight year old's getting close, but I do tell them things like, I don't mind spending the money on them if I feel like it's going to good use. My my daughters know how to ski. They're, they're still not quite parallel skiing. They're still doing a lot of wedge turns, but they're going down the mountain fast. They're having fun. My oldest asked if I wanted to, if she could learn how to snowboard because she has a friend at school who knows how to snowboard. And I told her, I actually don't mind spending the money on lessons for her to learn how to snowboard. I I don't mind. I, I even know how to, even though my snowboard and my boots and my bindings are broken because I haven't used them in five years. So if I wanted to get back into it, I could. I just need to get new equipment or rent the equipment. So I don't mind. I could even teach her how to snowboard. But she spent a couple winters just going down having fun. She's not focused on learning how to do the parallel skis. She kind of, she got enough to have fun and so she's going off with that and I told her I would like to see her kind of devote the mental energy and discipline to improving and show that she can get over this difficulty to learn how to parallel ski because that means that she'll probably go slower while her younger sister is going down faster because her younger sister isn't trying yet but if she showed me that she did have this discipline to learn parallel skiing and kind of put in the effort and put in the focus that I would be okay with going back to learning how to snowboard. Because anytime you are learning something new, there's going to be a lot of initial discouragement. And snowboarding especially, I, I've talked to other people, when you ski, theoretically, you could spend your first day without falling down. And I did a group lesson and in that hour, Eight of the people, first time on skis, didn't fall down in that hour. Two people fell down multiple times and took up all the instructor's time. So conversation about private versus public or group lessons is a, for a different day. With snowboarding, you are going to fall down many, 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 many times from the very beginning. And there's a lot of that kind of initial discouragement that, I, I don't know that my kids are ready for it yet, but the oldest one might be, but, and the, the middle one might have that personality that's emerging, but I, I wanted them to be able to enjoy it first before we, before trying to get really good at things. And that was the lesson I was telling her is like, I don't want you to try snowboarding and get discouraged and I would feel like it's a waste of money unless you show me that you can't, do have that capacity to get over that discouragement. And I think that's how I relate money to lessons I teach her, that I don't mind 
spending the money on something if I feel it's going to a good use. It seems like not only do you not mind doing that, but also you take the time to explain it to your child, your thought process on why you're making that decision and the rationale you, you brought with, with that understanding. Yes, very much so. I, my wife asked me questions about the business and I tell her I welcome all these questions because if I can't explain it, it's possible it's not the best decision or path. And that's a mm. general theme that I have. I don't know if it's related to parenting and money, but kind of I could explain why that laptop I bought was the best laptop for me in that moment because I had done so much of that research. And so for my kids, if I can't explain why I'm making this, this parenting decision, then maybe it's not the right decision. And sometimes the explanation is too old for them. And I have told them this in the past, like, that is a good question. That's a fair question. I don't think you are old enough to understand and internalize it. So I promise I will answer it in the future. But at this time, at your current age, I'm not going to answer that right now. And there's enough of those things that come up. And so there are times where I say, no, you need to get ready now. Put your shoes on. We are going. And like I've, they have to listen to me just because I said something. There are other times where I will take the time to explain some of the safety impacts. Like, no, ki cars drive fast, and if you are riding your bike out in the street while I trust you to be safe and look for cars, I know that your younger brother is watching you, and he's going to follow you, and he is not capable of looking for cars. That is why you are not allowed to ride your bike in the street. I want you to stay on the sidewalk. There are other times, no, don't go to the street, on the sidewalk. And, and so it's like, take it like sometimes requires your explanation but they also have to listen to you immediately mm -hmm. but that being able to explain your decisions especially to kids because some of those decisions are really difficult mm -hmm. kind of help develop both confidence to make the right decision but also they understand that they appreciate that right it's the notion that if you always say because I said so, it, it doesn't really give kids the confidence that you know what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> so it, there are times I do use because I said so, but it's usually related to, especially the younger, like they're being ornery, like they're resisting me just to resist me. They don't have a reason for not putting their shoes on, so I don't need a reason to tell them to put their shoes on, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> But, you can't, but you're right, you can't use that all the time. If that's right. the only thing you use, then you do lose credibility over time. So the feeling overall that I get is it, it seems like you had a pretty healthy relationship with money over your life in terms of it, it may not have always been ideal from the perspective of being a kid and not getting what you want, but also it seems like the values that your parents put into place led to the feelings that the situation you were in was understandable and sensible. And it also, I get the feeling, has led to the notion that you can be responsible with money when you're ready, and it seems like you were. Yeah. Yeah. The Responsibility is definitely a word that I like and use both for myself and with kids. Responsible with money is definitely a trait that I have. I do wonder if there are times where my default choice of looking at price first is kind of too ingrained and may not be healthy. I do know that kind of if I can't tell that it's quality, then I'll go to the cheapest option. So sometimes with like the, I'll buy the cheapest food option available. Like, oh, there's five cheeses available. And I'll buy the cheapest one. It's like, and, and then we get home. It's like, wow, this, this tastes kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> and there's enough times like that uh, over the years and even now that, the cheapest option is usually the cheapest option for a reason. <laughs> now, it could be a business decision and marketing strategy. It could be just 
lower quality, poor gradients, but that 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 default has kind of stung me just a little bit over the years. Although I think what I would say is when it comes to money, there there are some good problems to have and there are some not so great problems to have. <laughs> this might be on the the spectrum of okay, it's not <laughs> kind of sucks, but it, it's not the worst that, that you could be facing. Uh, you know what? Now that you say that, you're probably true. You're probably right. That that if the spectrum is default to the cheapest option or default to the assumption the most expensive thing is the best thing, right? you're probably much more responsible, much better off making good financial decisions if you do default to that the, the cheapest option. You're probably right. There, there's, that's probably a, a positive overall that I don't like the feeling of. Right. Well, you know, the, thank you, Aaron. This has been very helpful in terms of helping me to get a better understanding on how you approach money. I, I think I have a, a pretty good idea of why you make the decisions you do and what led you to those types of decisions. Well, thank you very much, Trisha. I, I knew this was coming. and I, I thought about a couple of stories that's coming, but you still asked some, some good questions I was not ready for. Uh, that's a great job by you. Well, well, thanks, Aaron, and I appreciate your time today, of course, and thanks, everybody, for listening. This was a great show, and we look forward to the next one. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of the Mind Money Spectrum podcast. Be sure to visit mindmoneyspectrum.com to access the entire library of episodes. Remember, it's not black and white, but the wide spectrum of gray area where you get to pursue the freedoms you want in life. Opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance referenced is historical as no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested directly. Have a nice day.